In this session, we will cover the last set of strategies, which are cooperative strategies. So basically strategies where companies enter into arrangement with other non-related companies to collaborate on certain business issues. So in this session, we will cover reasons for why companies would enter into such arrangements. We will talk about the actual strategies that companies can pursue when they want to collaborate with other companies. And finally, we will talk about some of the risks and pitfalls and challenges that come along with cooperative strategies and how to manage those risks. But as usual, we will start off with definitions and some terminology. So first of all, a collaborative cooperative strategy or strategic alliance, which is the main type of cooperative strategy that is defined as a strategy in which firms combine their resources and capabilities for the purpose of creating a competitive advantage. And that combination of resources and capabilities can come in various forms. It can be a complete um, joint venture, as we will see on the next slide, or it can be just an, a contractual arrangement where companies collaborate and work together. So types of those kind of strategic alliances are, first of all, the joint venture. A joint venture is defined as two or more firms come together and create a legally independent company. Um, typically, joint venture partners own equal percentages and they contribute equally to the ventures operations. And um, the reasons why companies come together or like the benefit of creating such a joint venture is to improve a company's ability to compete, especially when there's uncertain environments. Um, it establishes a long-term relationship. So this is, uh, you can imagine, this is kind of a marriage where you have a common child, which is the joint venture, and that binds the, the two companies together. And typically in joint ventures, you also have the transfer of some tacit knowledge. So knowledge that cannot be easily codified and that has to be learned through experience. So this is one of the big advantages of forming a joint venture um, that because of that marriage and that investment into the joint company, um, tacit knowledge can be transferred or shared between the companies. Um, similar, um, but different in terms of the holding structure is a so-called equity strategic alliance. So the difference is that companies don't hold equal percentage and don't contribute equally to the joint venture, but in equity strategic alliance, two companies just own different percentages, for example, 70-30 or 80-20, or uh, something like 60-20-20 um, if uh, there's a case of three partners um, once the, the new company is formed. But it still involves equity, so it means like a, a new um, company is being set up. The third type of strategic alliance is a non-equity strategic alliance. So in this case, it is really a contractual relationship that two or more firms uh, come together and form a, a contractual relationship. They share their resources and capabilities under this contract. That means that in such a relationship, there is no separate independent company. The original companies stay and collaborate just on that contractual basis. And uh, based on research, um, this has shown to create good value. But if it's very complex, then a, a structure like this, like a contractual structure, might not be suitable um, anymore. Examples um, for these non-equity strategic alliances are licensing agreements, uh, like franchising distribution agreements um, between companies, supply contracts, um, but also outsourcing agreements between two companies. So these are contractual relationships and partnerships that companies go into. So next, let's look at some of the reasons why companies might pursue a cooperation strategy. Um, and I want to separate the reasons by the speed of the market. So the first is a standard cycle market. Um, in this case, like the main reason actually is to gain market power. So reduce industry overcapacity, for example, by working together with a company. Um, through collaborations, you might gain access to new resources, to complementary resources that help you bring your company forward or might be of mutual benefit. Um, economies of scale. 
might be established through a joint venture or through a contractual relationship with another company. Um, if it is a cross-border partnership, then um, a cooperative strategy might help to overcome trade barriers. Um, maybe there's main major competitors and smaller competitors might come together um, in a collaborative or cooperative strategy to meet those competitive challenges of the bigger competitor. Pooling resources could be a reason, especially when it's about very large capital projects. So it's easier to um, carry the burden of a large capital project if uh, the burden is, is distributed over many parties. And also learning of new business techniques, uh, new uh, tacit knowledge as we already called it, might be another reason in a standard cycle market. Now, if you have a slow cycle market, so where changes occur on a much slower at a much slower pace. Um, one of the reasons to launch into a cooperative strategy might be to gain access to restricted markets where it's very difficult to enter because it's very uh, capital intensive or where regulation restricts a company from entering. Then having a local partner and going into a local partnership might be a good way. Um, franchising in a new market might be a possibility. And also, especially in slow cycle markets, cooperative strategies might help to maintain the market stability. For example, establishing standards across different markets and entering into an agreement on a certain uh, standard. Um, the, the most uh, common and most famous, uh, for example, is uh, the A4 uh, paper size, which works with all uh, copying machines around the world. Now, in a fast cycle market, where it's very imperative to have very um, fast innovation and very fast product development, cooperative strategies might help to speed up product development. Um, you might be able to speed up new market entry, especially when it's across uh, partnership across borders. Um, maintaining market leadership by having capabilities and um, uh, using, using the capabilities and skills of a partner I might play a big role here. Um, then forming an industry technology standard. So it's easier to or more predictable to innovate. Um, also linked to that sharing risky R&D expenses. Uh, R&D expenses in fast cycle markets are typically very high because companies are permanently forced to do something new and therefore partnering with other companies and jointly um, sharing the, the burden of those R&D expenses can be very helpful and very beneficial. And then overcoming uncertainty also. Um, if you imagine you work in an, an industry where you have to permanently innovate and come up with new, new standards and um, new technologies, then uh, getting alignment on these new technologies with uh, related companies can help to reduce the risk and reduce the uncertainty. So these are typ typically the main reasons for launching into cooperative strategies. Now, moving on to the actual strategy. So what can companies do? Um, how do these cooperative strategies look like? Starting with business level strategies, there are four types of cooperative strategies. The first one is a complementary strategic alliance. So in this case, companies that go into this partnership have somehow complementary resources. Um, this can happen on a vertical level. So for example, a supplier alliance, uh, which means you cover different stages in the value chain. You work together with your supplier. Um, you, you collaborate, you enter into a long-term partnership with one single supplier, and therefore you have certainty of the supply. And the supplier also has certainty of the offtake of their, their goods, and you can jointly develop new technologies and um, new research and development. Um, on a horizontal level, that's also possible. So firms in the same stage in the value chain also can join and um, can use the resources, combine their resources to create more benefit overall for the industry, and maybe um, having complementing a uh, complementary assets help defend or fend off some of the competitors. 
Um, the second type of strategy for cooperative strategies is a competition response strategy. So that, that's a defensive strategy and uh, basically helps to de defend against a competitive action that is taken by uh, major competitors. So by working with or uh, by combining the power of like smaller competitors, they might be able to fend off a major dominant competitor in the market. So these are competition response strategies. A third set of strategies is uncertainty reducing strategies. So in this case, companies work together, for example, on risky R&D or big CapEx projects, capital expenditure projects, um, new product development and so on to reduce the uncertainty. Uh, one of the areas here, for example, is in the car industry, a couple of years ago, car companies worked on different technologies. So some companies worked on hybrid technologies. Some companies were working on uh, an electric engine and some companies were working on hydrogen um, engines. So by just aligning across the industry, like aligning with the other companies in the industry on certain standards and a certain way forward, um, these expensive R&D efforts can be just reduced and uh, by having an industry association, for example, and collaborating in that industry association, you can uh, reduce the uncertainty around those new product developments or, or research and development costs. Um, the last one is actually a negative one, which is a competition reducing strategy. Now, uh, this is also called collusion. There's two types of collusion. There's explicit collusion, so the, these are direct agreements about the pricing or about the amount of production. Um, here, OPEC comes to mind, obviously, where um, on a country level, countries, oil producing countries come together and agree both on the, uh, basically they agree on uh, the output quantities that are being produced and therefore they determine uh, the global market prices for oil. Um, but I should mention here that these explicit collusion strategies are illegal in most countries and uh, there are regulators that monitor those behaviors very closely and if they see illegal activities like um, companies working together um, illegally or against the law they will take action against those companies um, it becomes a little bit more difficult if there's tacit collusion so if there's indirect coordination of production and, and pricing decisions um, by just looking at each other and observing each other's uh, actions and responses um, then it's quite difficult for regulators to intervene. Example for this one would be, for example, um, gas stations. And I'm thinking about the uh, European market um, where um, consumer protection groups have uh, highlighted this, that there is uh, tacit collusion between the gas station operators adjusting prices as um, uh, following each other's prices and therefore basically providing no point of differentiation to the consumer and uh, this is to the detriment of the consumer, so they claim. Um, so Im important, so some, some research on those strategies. So the first set of strategies, complementary alliances, have actually the greatest potential to generate competitive advantage, especially if they are vertical alliances. So working with a supplier, for example, on the development of new, of new technologies and, um, and collaborating on that level. Um, the last set of strategies, competition reducing strategies, usually have the lowest probability of really creating competitive advantage. They usually come at the expense of the customer um, and the companies there focus on collusion rather than developing a true competitive advantage. So this is typically to the detriment not only of the customer, but also innovation and progress overall. Now moving on to corporate level cooperative strategies, uh, quick definitions and uh, talking about some of the benefits. So corporate level cooperative strategies are strategies where you collaborate for the purpose of expanding the business operations um, in, into new areas, obviously on, on the corporate level. So benefits of this, those kind of corporate level cooperative strategies open of new markets, especially when you can't acquire a company. So when M&A is prevented, for example, by the regulator, by the government, um, then cooperative strategies offer a great potential to enter new markets, even though 
um, from a merchant acquisition perspective, this is not possible. Also, um, cooperative strategies require less uh, resources, fewer resources, um, are less costly compared to an acquisition. And they give quite a high level of flexibility in terms of the, the, the efforts to, to diversify uh, the partners' operations. Um, I should highlight here that if a merger and acquisition is allowed, even then companies might still decide to first collaborate and cooperate uh, with a partner um, just to test the market, maybe test the company, test the partnership, and then follow this by a real M&A. So very often we see a cooperative strategy first and that is then followed maybe two or three years later by an acquisition. So there's three types of corporate level cooperative strategies. The first one is a diversifying strategic alliance. So here companies share their resources, their capabilities to engage in diversification either on a product level, so coming up with new products in, in new markets and new areas, or on a geographic level, so finding new markets for the existing products. The second one is a synergistic strategic alliance. So here it's all about creating economies of scope, using the synergies across multiple functions. So for example, um, sharing services like HR services, financial uh, finance uh, services, corporate finance services, and uh, therefore bringing down the cost through the economies of scope of all the partners. Uh, an example for this um, are well shared services companies, shared service centers, uh, which are companies that operate, for example, in big industrial parks and provide services like HR, uh, like canteen services, catering services, uh, maybe even accounting services and so on. And a third type of corporate level cooperative strategy is franchising. So franchising very specifically is a contractual arrangement between completely independent firms yeah, typically the franchisor, the franchise owner and the franchisee, which is typically a, a smaller company, um, often a SME, um, to basically put the product under the franchise's uh, trademark in a certain place and, and a time frame. And uh, the franchisor uh, controls the sharing of the resources and capabilities with a, with a partner and the franchisee provides those resources. So um, obviously in the restaurant industry, this is very common um, that you have a brand owner such as uh, RBI Restaurant Brands International for the case of Burger King, for example, and you have a franchisee that um, operates the Burger King restaurant using their resources and uh, their own local capabilities to run the Burger King restaurant in the geography that uh, has been contractually agreed. So again, uh, based on research, corporate level cooperative strategies um, are typically broader in scope and more complex. And uh, therefore they are also more challenging and typically also more costly. So uh, this is something to look out for. Finally, we have to look at some of the risks and some of the challenges that come along with corporate level or even business level cooperative strategies. So some of the risks that are related to the management of those contracts, of those contractual relationships. So definitely one of the risks is that the contract is inadequate. So maybe it doesn't cover all the areas. Maybe there are loopholes. Um, and uh, this can pose a legal risk from a, from a contractual perspective. Uh, the second risk is that maybe companies enter into those agreements and misrepresent their competencies. What does that mean? Either um, they overstated their company, competencies from the beginning. And then when it comes to the actual collaboration, then the actual competencies are disappointing or they don't send their best resources and uh, all their competencies into the joint venture or into the uh, collaboration effort. And uh, therefore, the, the 
joint venture or the collaboration effort falls short of the expectations. And uh, maybe also the expectations of the different business partners are not clearly represented in the contract, not clearly stated in the contract, and therefore there are discrepancies between the expectations of the management and the actual outcome. So these are all risks related to the, the contract itself. And then there are also risks related to the behavior of the partners. So sometimes partners just fail to use their complementary resources, as I already um, mentioned, that maybe there's the right agreement already in, in the contract, but the companies just don't send their best people. Um, sometimes it's also a way to just hold the alliance partner specific investments hostage yeah, and um, well, just, just misbehave and um, uh, just make use of the fact that um, the alliance partner has already invested a large amount of money while actually not contributing to the joint purpose, but just um, trying to benefit uh, one-sided from the agreement. Um, maybe there are different spending philosophies. Maybe one company is quite generous in the spending, the other company is quite careful in the spending, and therefore there's a clash when it comes to the joint venture. And um, there might also be different working standards, safety standards, for example, where one company has very high standards and uh, very sophisticated and is very careful in not uh, making mistake or cause, causing any safety hazards. And the other company um, has much lower standards and that can create, of course, conflict, but it can also create a risk, a reputational risk to the company with the higher standards. So all of these are risks that have to be considered when entering into a collaboration or a cooperative strategy with a company. So how to manage this? There are two ways uh, to think about this. One is to just minimize the cost and therefore minimize the exposure and minimize the risk. So in this case, you might put in the contract specific clauses and be very specific about how the strategy should be monitored, how the behavior is controlled, putting a lot of restrictions and controls in place and uh, therefore, well, creating a level of mistrust and being overly cautious on each of the contributions, um, a tit for tat strategy where you carefully watch what the other party is doing and only if the other party moves, you also move. The result of this cost minimization strategy is that it typically results in both parties just trying to minimize the cost and the risk from the joint activities and therefore not living up to the full potential of the collaboration. A much better approach is, and, and a much more trusting approach, is the approach of opportunity maximization. Um, so in this case, the contracts are much less formal and have fewer constraints on the partners. There is a possibility to jointly explore how the resources, the capabilities can be shared always with the purpose of creating the best value. Um, the overall focus is less on controlling, but much more on the business activities themselves. And it's really always very top and bottom line focus, not cost focus at all, but creating the biggest benefit. And the result of this is typically that there's a much higher likelihood of value creation from this opportunity maximization. Now, I need to be mentioned that this needs trust. And um, trust takes time to establish. It takes a certain management approach and um, here a certain level of uh, business friendship, if you can talk about friendship in, in business terms, but, but a certain level of friendliness towards each other is definitely required here. And uh, based on research, this works quite well, or works better on a domestic level and is much more difficult to establish in international cooperative strategies. Um, right or wrong, it seems like we seem to trust our own countrymen more uh, than in people in other countries, uh, according to research at least. Yeah, so, but uh, the, the big takeaway is that uh, cost minimization is always the worst approach and opportunity maximization with a trusting relationship between the partners is a better approach and can create higher value. So that brings us to the end of uh, this session and it also brings us to the end of the strategy formulation process. So we have covered 
the most important strategies. And um, with the next set of sessions, we will move into strategy implementation.